I was in downtown St. Louis during Supercomputing 21, a conference about, well, supercomputers. Why? Well, I just so happened to have this board, which runs four high-performance servers, at least in terms of gigaflops per watt. This is the Turing Pi 2. It's a $200 mini ITX motherboard that holds up to four Raspberry Pis or Jetson Nanos, and it has a lot of other tricks up its sleeve. Anyways, at the Arch, I ran into someone unexpected, and he gave me a challenge. You are never gonna guess who I met here in St. Louis at the Arch today. This is Patrick from Serve the Home. He actually told me that he'd built a four node server in a box a few years back. Oh and, yeah. And he's challenging me now to do the same thing today in 2021. I'm gonna do it with four of these little guys and he's gonna build one too, but it might be a little bit different. What are the ground rules here? Okay, so basic ground rules of this thing, we should have at least four arm nodes and it has to be in one box. And I think also we should go and get together in like, let's call it two weeks or so. And maybe we'll go compare notes and see what we both built. All right, that sounds like a plan. Let's see what happens. I literally have no idea what Patrick's gonna build, but I'm guessing his four nodes will use a lot more power than my little pie cluster that could. But it'll be interesting to see how it compares. Well, I have this board and four eight gig compute module fours. Let's build a pie cluster. The thing I like most about this board is that it's mini ITX, which means it will fit in tons of standard PC cases. As an example, I have this BC1 mini build platform and I can just use the Turing Pi with this out of the box. I don't have to build any adapters or do any 3D printing. So the first thing you'll notice if you compare the new board to the old one is that there's a lot more going on. And that's because this new board exposes each of the Pi's PCI Express lanes to an individual function on the board. And I'll go over those later. But also there's a lot of IO around the edges of the board that's new for a Pi. For, for example, this is the first board that has a full 24 pin ATX power header. So you can power this board from any standard PC power supply. It also has headers for uh, the front panel for power switch and LEDs. It has a front panel USB 3.0 header. It has USB 3 on the back. It has dual gigabit ethernet. Uh, controlled through this RTL 8370 Ethernet switch, which means I don't have to have an external switch to power all these different Pis over the network. So it's really cool for all that. And up here it has UART, uh, it has a JTAG header. This STM32 chip allows the board to run some custom firmware that also wasn't present on the original Turing Pi, and it has uh, better cold start capabilities and it, it staggers the boot of the Pis. All these different things can be controlled in the firmware. It also gives you an interface through to things like the RTC clock and the ethernet switch. So that is a huge quality of life improvement. Now, as I mentioned, you can use any standard PC power supply and I went way overkill with an SF600 from Corsair. This is a 600 watt A plus platinum power supply. The main reason I'm choosing it for this build is because at some point I'm planning on using the same power supply in a build that will have a, a graphics card in it and the graphics card is going to need that power but this board can be powered in many other ways. In fact, I also have a Pico PSU, and this is probably the more practical way of powering the board. This is a little power supply that has all the cables you need, and uh, all you need is a barrel plug power adapter, and I have a few different ones, and this will power everything on the Turing Pi, just the same as this power supply, uh, but this one has a little bit more heft and, and beef to it. Uh, so I'm gonna mount it up here with some of the included thumb screws. Okay, so we have our power supply. Another thing I like about this build platform is it has some cutouts in here so I can route power cables through it. And I'm just gonna stick these guys through here. The good thing is they don't come out easy, but uh, the bad thing is you usually cut your fingers on these things. So we have power for the board. I'm also gonna be installing this hard drive. It's a two terabyte crucial SSD. And um, it has a, I have a little SATA cable that I'll plug through the board, but it's gonna need power too. So I'm gonna route this um, SATA power cable as well. And I'll go ahead and mount up this SATA drive. And I'll plug in the data. All right, and now I'm ready for the board itself. So I'm gonna mount it up on these four posts. Now this, the BC1 actually has uh, posts for snap mounting too, but for this board, it's gonna have a lot of things plugged into it, so I don't really wanna have it have any potential of falling off. So I'm gonna screw it down on here. All right, so I got that in and I'm gonna connect up power. I'm gonna to need to get a little bit more slack out of here. All right, so we got power to the board and I'm gonna plug this into the SATA port. SATA, not SATA. The next thing is I'm gonna install the Raspberry Pis. Now, you might be wondering, 
if you look at these slots, these are not compute module four slots. They're actually uh, SODIMM slots. And if you have something like an NVIDIA Jetson, you can actually plug this straight in and you could build a hybrid cluster with NVIDIA Jetsons and Compute Module 4s if you wanted, or do all of one or all of the other. It's up to you. Uh, but in my case, I'm going to use some Compute Module 4s, and they need an, a special adapter board. And this adapter board is kind of like its own Compute Module 4 board on its own. So we're going to install the Compute Module 4s on here. Now I have four 8 gigabyte Compute Module 4 lights, and uh, they get kind of hot when you're doing clustered computing or running Kubernetes or something like that. So I also have four heat sinks for them. So I'm going to put the heat sinks on them before I put them on these daughter cards. And then I'm going to put all the cards into the slots and then we'll have our cluster and we can boot it up and see what happens. So the pies actually run okay without heat sinks, but to be safe, it's nicer to have the heat sink just to get that heat off of the pies SOC quicker. And if you put a fan in whatever case you're going to put this in, it'll get that heat right out of there very fast and, and keep your cluster running at full performance. So these heat sinks come with thermal pads for the power chip as well as the SOC, which is in the middle of the board. I think people who build full-size PCs have it easy. They have screws that are actually visible to the naked eye. I haven't actually tested these heat sinks with this uh, setup. We'll see if they actually fit or not. So while I finish up this last one, I should also mention that um, the Pi's system on a chip does get pretty hot in operation, but I actually am going to take a thermal camera and I'll put the overlay on the on the video right now so you can see what it looks like. I took some thermal images of the board itself and it, it seems like of all the processors on the board, probably that ethernet switch will get the hottest. And I know on the old Turing Pi board, I had to put a heat sink on it to keep it a little cooler. So might have to do the same thing on here. We'll see, I'll, I'll be testing it. All right, so we have our four Pi's. We have our four cards and let's get them all loaded onto the board. Uh, you can actually mount them up if you have all the right adapters and things, but I'm just gonna plug them in and rely on the friction fit of these 100 pin connectors. And that's all there is to it. Stick it in the board like so. All four of these slots have their own PCI Express lane exposed on the board in some different way. I actually have a couple cards here uh, this one is a Google Coral TPU, which as I said in my previous video, the drivers for the Raspberry Pi still aren't quite there, uh, but it might work with some other boards. And these cards should be compatible with RADS's CM3 and with Pine64 SO quartz. So I'm gonna try those out at some point, but for now I'm just gonna see if it shows up. Uh, this one I will put into uh, this slot over here on the side, which I believe is connected to node two. And I also have this mini SATA card that's also um, mini PCIe, and I'm gonna put that in over here. Sometime I would like to test out uh, LTE networking and have this be a completely portable wireless Pi cluster. Uh, we'll see if I can make that happen or not, but that would be, I think, a fun project. Let me know if that's something that you'd like to see me do. It's very expensive, so that's why I'm not committing to it yet. And then you might be wondering, where are all the other PCI Express lanes exposed? Well. One of them goes to these two SATA ports. I believe that's on node three. And then node four has a VLI VL805 USB 3 chip that goes out to these USB 3 ports on the back and the front panel USB 3 header. So you, you might be tempted to think that uh, the SATA ports can be seen by all the Pi's somehow magically, but that's just not how it works. The idea being that you could have one Pi be kind of like the storage controller with, with SATA. Another Pi could be the wireless network connectivity and you can build your cluster that way so they share the resources. Um, and that's actually a good pattern for the Pi because the Pi only has PCIe Gen 2, so you can't get a ton of bandwidth. This is a healthy compromise because you do have a little bit of freedom with these mini PCIe slots. And you can get adapters like I have for the key A and E adapter for the coral that goes into mini PCIe. The last thing I wanna do is make sure that this stays cool. And I was gonna use this board, but I actually found out uh, from Turing Pi, I've been talking to them about this board. This is a 12 volt PDBM fan and it plugs directly into the fan header on the board. However, the firmware currently doesn't have the PDBM fan control set up in it. So for now, this one is actually powered off. So what I'm going to do instead 
is use this Noxua PWM fan that's 5 volt and you can plug it into USB. And I have Noxua's uh, PWM fan controller so I can control the speed of it. So it's not just going full blast all day because I've lived like that before and I don't like having my right hand get frozen while I'm doing these projects. For airflow, this location is not exactly perfect, uh, but it is good. It'll get air past all of these. You'd want to have airflow going this way to get all the heat out of those heat sinks. All right, so it's going to go into USB cable managed. So I already loaded up these four cards um, using the Raspberry Pi imager. And with the Pi imager, you can actually set a host name. So I set this as Turing node 1, Turing node 2, Turing node 3, and Turing node 4. And I put my uh, SSH keys on them so that when I boot them up, I should be able to log right into them without having to do any discovery or any uh, passwords or anything like that. Uh, so I'm going to put each one of these into the micro SD card slots on these boards. Okay. And I'm going to go ahead and plug in power. And then when I switch this on, the board should come on. And once it comes on, it should start its boot process. And I believe it boots each Pi in succession. Um, I'm also going to connect it to HDMI so I can see what happens on the monitor. The HDMI port is connected to node 1. So you can only see node 1's video output. You can't see any of the other nodes uh, through this connection. And uh, Ethernet, this is set up by default in a bridged configuration. So don't plug both of these jacks into your network at the same time or mayhem results. No sparks, that's good. Here comes power to each of the pies. And if I look at the back of the boards, I can see the power LEDs on each of those pies as well. All right, so it looks like they're all booting up. And if I turn on my monitor, I should be seeing the video output from the first pie. And it looks like it's already booted completely. Now, I have to admit, I cheated and booted it once before to make sure that they actually boot. Um, so it already did its uh, disk expansion and all that stuff. So what I can do now on my computer is I'm going to log in to the node 1 and see what I can see on it. So sshpy at turing node 1.local, I believe it is. And if I say lspci, now I can see that there's a SATA controller, and that is this SATA controller, the one that I just plugged in here. Um, so you can, you can have all four populated with different PCI Express devices, but the last two have the built-in PCI Express devices. So if I log out of here and log in to node four and run LSPCI, I can see that there's a VL805 USB 3 host controller, and that's plugged into these ports and the front panel header, like I mentioned earlier. So one thing that I really like on this version of the board that wasn't on the original is all the blinking lights. They're very helpful for the, for the status. There's these red ones, which means that the slot has power to it. The microcontroller controls whether there's power to the slot or not. On the other side, there are link and activity lights for each slot's ethernet activity. And of course, on the back, there's link and activity on each of these network jacks. Uh, and then there's a board power light. That's the first green LED. And then system power means that the, the microcontroller is powered up and can control all the boards. So all those are on there. And on the back of each of these cards, there's a power and activity LED for each Pi itself. Blinking lights are one thing, but I wanna see how this cluster performs. And to do that, I need a way to interact with all four Raspberry Pis without tearing my eyes out. I'll use Ansible since, well, I wrote a book on it. I set up this basic inventory file to tell Ansible how to find the nodes and I put them into a few groups like control plane, nodes, and cluster, which will be helpful when I set up Kubernetes in a future video. So with this, I should just be able to run ansible all-m ping and get a response from all the nodes. Let's see if that works. Nice. Now, the other thing I wanted to do was run HPL, or High Performance Linpack. This is the benchmark the top 500 supercomputer list uses, and since they just updated the list at SC21, I thought it'd be nice to know how my Pi cluster stacks up. So I built this playbook that builds MPI, Atlas, and HPL so I can benchmark the cluster. And of course, I put it up on GitHub. It's open source like everything else I do. So if you have your own cluster, you can run the exact same benchmark. I ran the playbook, but I had trouble getting the benchmark to run on the whole cluster. It would just hang instead of running the benchmark. As with almost every problem I encounter these days, the problem was DNS. Hey, I have a shirt for that redshirtjeff.com. Anyways, after I figured out I had to add all the node IP addresses to each of the node's host files so they could all see each other, I ran the HPL benchmark. And the cluster put out a respectable 45 gigaflops. This cluster would have qualified for the November 1999 top 500 list. 
Not too shabby considering those clusters are running 64 or 128 CPU cores, and this one only has 16. But what's more interesting to me is the potential for more energy efficient computing. The Turing Pipe 2 is billed as a potential edge server, and a lot of places where they'd be deployed might be running off solar or have a limited power budget. It's great to put out hundreds of gigaflops, but if doing that causes a brownout, it's not really a good solution. And here's where this little pie cluster does pretty decent. If we rank it in the current November 2021 green 500 list, it would actually rank somewhere around 150, getting 1.83 gigaflops per watt. Granted, the other machines in the list were pumping through over 2,000 teraflops, but still, by my calculations, I'd only need eh, around 150,000 more compute modules to make it to the top 500 list. And that's just the thing. The Pi isn't going to be a compute monster. Its CPU cores are pretty power efficient, but even compared to an M1 Mac, they're just not that fast. But they are small and relatively cheap, and that's why places like the Los Alamos National Laboratory built a 750 node Raspberry Pi cluster in 2017. They realized they could still learn and test on a smaller, more efficient cluster, and then run their final workloads on the big, beefy production servers. The Pis can be densely packed without eating megawatts of power, and that beats out a lot of other types of servers if quantity is more important than raw performance. But let's be real, for most people, the laptop or tablet you're using to watch this is already faster than my Pi cluster. My M1 MacBook Air uses less power than the cluster and still puts out about 40 gigaflops using only the CPU. But it can't run Linux yet, so there's that. Now that we know how this little Pi cluster performs, I think it's time to see what Patrick's been up to. All right, so it's been a couple weeks. Have you finished your build? Yes, I did. All right, well, I want to see it. And how about we both reveal our builds at the same time and then, you know, we'll see what they look like. All right, I think that's an awesome idea. Are you ready? Yeah. Three, two, one. Ta-da! I notice you're not holding yours. Can you, uh, can you turn it? Is it something you can hold in your hand? Yeah, it's a little, it's a little bigger than uh, yours, I guess, is. And even has like a fancy, fancy glass window. Oh my. Yeah, so this is just kind of a pretty, pretty basic cluster. All in one box. Single, nice uh, fractal design chassis. And I see yours is all like together. You don't have like a case or anything on it, but it's all put yeah, together. So, well, for this first build, I, I built it. This is a BC1 mini benchtop ITX uh, frame. And I wanted to build it here because I wanted to be able to do everything to it and kind of experiment on it. I, right now there's a SATA board and a Coral TPU and stuff, but I'm gonna do some other things before I put it into my rack. So I, 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 I kind of went a guess maybe a little bit bigger but so this is just kind of a pretty standard uh standard cluster in a box these days uh so here what we have is an amd uh threadripper pro so 64 core processor uh there are eight dim modules of course for that processor with 64 gigs each so we have a half a terabyte of memory uh and then over here um these are actually the arm because we said we had at least four arm nodes there are seven slots so i figured well why don't we just do seven slots and so uh, these are actually the Mellanox Bluefield 2 DPUs, and they're the VPI cards. So I can run either InfiniBand or I can run Ethernet. There's two 100 gig ports on each, and both the host Threadripper system as well as the Bluefield 2 DPU, uh, each little ARM core complex can actually access both of those. So we actually have about 1.4 terabits per second of networking uh, built into this. And then in terms of each card, you get a total of eight two gigahertz ARM Cortex A72 cores. You get 16 gigabytes of memory per uh, card, and then you also get 64 gigabytes of storage. So they're all running Ubuntu right now, uh, just to kind of make it easy, as well as running Ubuntu on the uh, main Threadripper system as well. And then of course, because this is a really kind of cool ASUS board, we actually have a ARM, another ARM processor that is on here as well, which is actually the A-Speed BMC. So you have another thing that goes and provides all the out-of-band management features that you'd want as well. So you mentioned that you're getting terabits of bandwidth through the network connections? Yeah, this is about 1.4 1, 1 terabits per second because you have, you have seven cards each with, uh, maybe I can spin this. <laughs> so, so yeah, so you can see that each card, they're PCIe uh, Gen 4 by 16 cards. So they actually have 200 gig ports each because you can run 200 gig networking off of a PCIe Gen 4 by 16 slot. Well, I'm proud to say that this has two gigabit Ethernet ports, so. We can get a whole gigabit of network connectivity out of this. But I mean, I think that brings up an interesting point here. 
This, oh, Jeff, there, there's also two 10 gig ports here and then an out of band one gig management port as well. So I, I think that brings up a good point here though. It, like the Turing Pi 2 is not meant to be some sort of IO monster and the Raspberry Pi only has PCIe Gen 2. That one is not built for like necessarily edge computing where you're power limited or you wanna have wireless connectivity and you might be limited to under a gigabit of total bandwidth. Right, so these are actually, of course, supposed to be used in servers, but I just kinda of wanted to show that you could actually go build a cluster in a single box using this. And, you know, we have 56 ARM cores. You have 112 gigs of RAM just on the ARM side and I think a little over 440 gigs of storage just on the ARM side of this. And then we also have, you know, the Threadripper Pro, so we have another 64 cores, another half terabyte of memory, and a couple terabytes of, of SSD storage as well. I'm also interested to know, uh, do you have a ballpark estimate of how much that whole system with everything would cost? I'm going to guess a little bit more, uh, more than that system. Um, but on the other hand, I can't get one of those Turing Pi boards, so... Priceless. It's basically, you basically have a priceless system. This is one that you can just order. So Petra's cluster might be a little more beefy than mine. It has hundreds of cores, terabits of IO, and PCI Express Gen 4. Of course, it has the price tag and power requirements to match, but that's not the point. Both of our builds approach the same problem, building a cluster of ARM-based computers. The end result is radically different, but the cool thing is maybe you're just starting out with clustering, or maybe you have a limited budget or limited power. The Turing Pi 2 is great for that. Not everyone needs 100 CPU cores and 1.4 terabits of bandwidth. Those who do usually have a budget to match, and they have a much more realistic chance of hitting near the top 500 supercomputers. But even without that muscle, the Turing Pi 2 offers a lot, and coming in around 200 bucks for the board itself and 10 bucks for the Compute Module 4 adapter cards, it's not too expensive. It should be released early in 2022, and the board I'm testing is a late prototype, but not the exact final version. I'll be covering more aspects of the Turing Pi 2, like rack mounting it in this mini ITX enclosure from My Electronics, so make sure you subscribe. Until next time, I'm Jeff Gearling. I need to think, PC power, head, P, uh, power supply, that's it, power supply. You got it. <laughs> this is uh, like a vengeance mission. quality STH Yeti right here. I don't think they're selling this yet, but uh, each of these heat sinks comes with its own little screwdriver, so we'll see how many screwdrivers I end up with at the end of this. I believe you're supposed to try to get as many of your finger oils on these things as you can. Now it's stuck. Oh, well, that's weird.